Hello, and welcome to the Center for Health Design's Evidence-Based Design Journal Club. Thanks for joining us. I'm Alan Card, your host for today's session. As a bit of an introduction, I'm a research associate with the Center for Health Design, where I'm working on several special projects, including the development of the Center for Health Design's online safety, research, safety risk assessment. I hold a PhD from the University of Cambridge and an MPH from the University of South Florida, as well as professional certifications in public health, healthcare quality, and healthcare risk management. My research interests focus on patient safety, healthcare quality, uh, patient experience and disaster preparedness, and I also serve as the editor of the Journal for Healthcare Risk Management. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the HERD Journal for providing free access to the articles we typically review. If you have not already done so, we recommend subscribing to HERD. There is a discount code for attendees to receive 10% off the subscription. Special thanks to today's sponsor, Steelcase Health. The purpose of the Evidence-Based Design Journal Club is to engage the healthcare design community in a dialogue regarding important research to help us better understand the links between the built environment and health-related outcomes and to apply it in the real world. I would now like to introduce the authors of the article we're discussing today, Stephanie Trespas and Sophia Skemp. Stephanie Trespas is a design research and knowledge management specialist at BWBR. Stephanie leads design research, expertise sharing, and information management initiatives to enhance knowledge sharing culture at BWBR. She oversees and conducts design research across market typologies and has work published in Health Environments Research and Design Journal, including the article, Does Space Matter? An Exploratory Study for Child Adolescent Mental Health Inpatient Unit. Ms. Trespas is also an adjunct instructor and frequent guest lecturer at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and an invited pres presenter at industry conference events. Sophia Skemp is an emerging medical planner at BWBR. Taking experiences from immersive internship in both design research and healthcare architecture, Sophia works closely with senior medical planning professionals and project teams. Her work includes the Hennepin County Medical Center, Ambulatory Outpatient Specialty Center, Health Partners Neuroscience Center, Mayo Clinic's Obstetrics Gynecology, Reproductive Endocrinology, and Infertility Relocation, and multiple facility master plans. Sophia is a co-author of Does Space Matter, an exploratory study for child adolescent mental health inpatient unit, published in HERD, um, the Health Environments Research and Design Journal. Thanks, both of you, for joining us today. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. We're excited to be here. As I mentioned, we're hosting this event to identify the everyday practical applications of research findings in a published article. Today's featured article, Does Space Matter? An, an exploratory study for child adolescent mental health inpatient unit from the Health Environments Research and Design Journal. On today's call, we'll have an active discussion about different key factors in your study. And with that, if you would please take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before we get into a lot of the details of our study, we wanted to provide you with some just general context of our um, of the study. And uh, this was a nearly 20,000 square foot renovation project for the University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. And of course, being a renovation project, there was a lot of constraints with a mid 20th century building, double loaded corridors. Uh, block wall construction, punch windows and such. Uh, but two of the floors of that building were renovated to be the new mental health units and unique to it, it was a child adolescent population that we'll um, be des describing today. And mental health is a unique inpatient setting uh, for that and the fact that it was child adolescent ranging from the early school age to early adult. We were also very uh, excited to have uh, an enthusiastic client involved with this project. And so a big uh, thank you out to Karen Wendt and Susan Heitzman for their contributions, willingness, and just eagerness to not only share this with our design community, but share it with their peers as well. And one part that also should be noted as part of this project is that Karen and uh, the team there were really active in instituting a new care model that focused on reducing restraint and seclusions uh, for this population as a means of calming during escalations. And their care model was really focused on uh, trying to help children learn coping skills and to, for that emotional regulation. And as you can see from the photos on the right, they were in an existing environment that really did not support this care model. And so they saw this new project as a great opportunity uh, to move that forward. 
just going to share a couple of key photos here so you can get some context of the project before Sophie goes into the methodology. On the left here, we have the intake area. And because this is a mental health unit, it is a secure entry point for that. And that can be really scary for the patients and the families that are involved. And so there was some design features involved, such as the semi-opaque glass that helped to just kind of create that visibility of what might be happening on the unit while still protecting the privacy of the patients involved. And it was really intended to instill a sense of hope uh, and all the spaces for that instead of amplifying that stigma that we might normally find with mental health units. Uh, once you're inside the unit, uh, the nurse station is really bright and vibrant with some nature-based images and backlit panels, and the staff is very accessible and approachable as well. The corridors were also designed to be very um, uh, purposeful and non-threatening. I can see of bright colors, but also just between the patient rooms, there's these small areas called front porches that you can see on the right. And these are just small uh, stools outside of the patient rooms that may help uh, with the patients as they're transitioning from maybe more private spaces into socialized spaces, and which can be a challenge uh, for a lot of this population. Staff have also been observed to sit on these front steps or front porches and just engage in conversations with this young population for them. Uh, there's 32 patient rooms in uh, between these two uh, the units. There was, I think, let's see, there's 12 semi-private rooms and eight private rooms located on the primary unit, and then an additional 12 uh, private rooms located on what they call the ITC, or the Intensive uh, Treatment Care Unit. And the rooms were all designed uh, with safety in mind. Uh, they are very simple, they're colorful, and they're safe from a lot of self-harm. The, uh, the rooms that are located over in the ITC were also called needs adaptable rooms. And we don't have a photo of that one here, but what was unique about those rooms is that many of them had a sleeper sofa inside the room that would encourage family to come and even stay overnight and be a part of the process. On the left here is the group room, or called the rainbow room, uh, from the staff and the patients. It's designed with curved walls to eliminate corners and really to encourage the conversations that would be happening uh, for, uh, between the patients and the staff. And on the right is a sensory room. Uh, this is a room that really encourages large muscle movement. It has writable wall surfaces. There's a bubble column that's just out of uh, view of this photo. And uh, muscle movement and physical activity is a really a key component of the care model here. And this is one room that does it. Uh, a couple other rooms that uh, we're able to incorporate or encourage large muscle movement, which is difficult to do on an existing kind of double-loaded corridor uh, floor plan, uh, there's an activity room as seen here on the left where there's an integrated Xbox and they have small group yoga sessions in there. Mm -hmm. And then during activity time, uh, many of the patients can be seen riding scooters all the way down the hallway. Uh, so it can be a very active space and it's a, it's a big part of their care model to encourage that physical okay. activity. A couple of unique spaces off the unit, uh, there was a specialized playground that was across the street from this unit, and it was designed very specifically to be stimulating but also safe uh, for this patient environment. And I believe they've even incorporated uh, raised uh, gardening beds in this area. And then a really unique feature is really a recommissioned pool that was located on the lower level of the building, and uh, staff have just said that it's been widely successful in terms of therapy uses and outcomes. All right. Thanks, Steph. So throughout the project, there were five key design strategies implemented, one being attention to color, form, and materials seen through the gentle curved walls and soft seating, and uh, attention to color and artwork chosen. Secondly, choice, control, and non-threatening environments was very important. And we'll get into more detail later on in the presentation regarding that key design strategy. It's really important as well to balance uh, the areas of privacy and social activities. We don't want to um, isolate a patient necessarily, and we also don't want to maybe force them into an uncomfortable social situation. So providing areas for both is very important. And as Steph mentioned, fostering any physical activity and um, engaging in large muscle movement really helps the patient expend any excess energy and uh, calms them down. And lastly, connection to nature is extremely important, and research has shown that uh, even a view to the exterior can aid in reductions of symptoms associated with depression. And we did have a unique challenge since our setting uh, was located in an urban environment, but, but even uh, allowing as much natural light into the space and incorporating artwork of, of, of nature seems uh, helps, helps greatly. 
So the key design strategies can be seen at a larger scale, uh, like Steph mentioned, the pool and the playground. But they can be seen um, at smaller scale and more detailed design features. And I'm just going to mention a couple of those uh, here. So the sensory room is an intimate, flexible space uh, designed to stimulate both calm and uh, stimulate uh, activity. And along with storage for play, for play activities and the writable vertical surfaces, and the bubble column, and the swing, and the zip line. There are also these patient-controlled uh, lights and music panels throughout the room. And these are used to accommodate uh, individual patients' needs and really drive home that design strategy of fostering physical activity but promoting choice and control. And those lighting controls, those lighting dimmers, and the music panels can be seen not, not just in the activity room, but throughout the unit as well in different patient spaces. Another unique design feature can be seen in the activity room um, featuring the interactive Xbox 360. Um, patients are able to engage in positive muscle movement and build exercise skills in this room. And the activity room specifically features uh, user-adjustable accent lights as well and liquid-filled interactive tile blocks you can see in the photo. Um, Stepping on the tiles moves the liquid around, um, uh, moves and morphs it, leaving a footprint and really um, gradually fades away and encourages movement and creativity. And although it's not a key design strategy, but providing enough storage space uh, for a clean, uncluttered, less distracting look is best practice in these areas. And then the quiet room, identified uh, with gently curved walls to create a uniquely shaped room for patients to engage in calming activities. So we just saw rooms that really are um, all about muscle movement and physical activity, and this is the, this is the opposite. So the soft colored room features user-adjustable lighting as well. But soft seating choices and curved wood bench along the walls, a circle alcove, with the curved bench provides patients an area of retreat and more focused relaxation and a sense of protection. So really driving home the design strategy of form and material and color and that balance between private spaces, spaces and social spaces. So. Great. Well, and now finally to our study, what did we really uh, study for this? And we knew this project was unique, and it was a good candidate for us to examine in closer detail because we knew it was a very unique and challenging population, and there was lack of existing available research at the time. And so we sought a very exploratory study for this to ask, for us to even begin to ask that question of does space matter? And does it matter to this population, to the staff, or to the families that are involved in this process? So we did not look at any one particular element or thing within the environment, but rather as a collective arrangement influencing the occupants within. We had three uh, objectives going into it. We were very, of course, interested in which environmental characteristics that we thought the staff and the patients uh, thought contributed to them feeling calm uh, within the unit. And then also uh, investigating staff perceptions uh, from a variety of angles uh, within the environment, but particularly about its influence on patient behaviors. And then also because this was exploratory and we were um, seeking to use a tool that hadn't really been utilized in previous studies, we wanted to begin the process of validation for a new measurement tool, which is the patient uh, image survey that Sophie is going to talk about. So hopefully that provided a really quick context, and we're going to get right into uh, the methods. Thank you. So once again, our setting was the Univers University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health inpatient unit 7A and 7ITC, 7A being the child adolescent inpatient unit and ITC, the in intensive treatment care unit. And although they are two units, they are located on the same floor and they are run by the same staff and share a lot of the same spaces. And our sample group was staff and patients. Uh, originally, we did have the desire to include the family in the study and get that family perspective, which is very important. but Due to the lack of access to the family members and the need to narrow the scope of the project, we were not able to. But however, that perspective did come across and was incorporated in the feedback 
given by the staff and the staff want to face-to-face interviews. So the methods utilized in this project include the staff online surveys, the staff face-to-face -face interviews, and the patient image survey. And although the research included both qualitative and quantitative approaches, the study provided mostly qualitative results. So for example, the patient image survey is technically quantitative, but the nature of the images, which you will see later on, evoked a more qualitative finding for us. So the staff online survey. Uh, it was sent um, online to the staff, and staff responses were anonymous. We sent 75 surveys, uh, and 52 staff responded, which was great. We did want to point out that the survey included four demographic questions that you can see on the screen right here. And this was important in order for us to know we were really achieving a representative, a representative sample of the staff. And the survey collected quantitative data on staff's attitudes and their perceptions of safety, perceptions of teamwork, patient interactions, and then once again, the family perce uh, perception uh, interactions while they were on the unit. And all the staff who responded to the online survey were then granted the opportunity to participate in a face-to-face -face interview with Steph and myself. And a total of 25 interviews were conducted and uh, continued until saturation was attained. And as mentioned before, the family perspective uh, was able to come through through questions in the staff interview. Um, so that was, it was really great. All right, the patient image survey. That was administered by trained staff, and it contained images of rooms, spaces, uh, and key design features in a graphic format. And if the patient agreed to complete the survey, a staff member would show a patient a sheet of 27 photographs of various envi environmental areas and features upon their discharge. And staff asked each patient, patient to circle images that evoked a sense of calm to them during their stay. Um, response choices were, uh, were anonymous. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into further detail in the patient image survey in this section as well. So this is an example of what the pa one patient image survey looked like. And the surveys were administered over a four-month period. And since the same image and response options were available, on three different versions of the survey, we recorded uh, those with, with a letter to indicate which survey was used. Mm -hmm. um, there was no limit to the images each patient were allowed to select, and measures to protect against coercion included allowing patients to complete the survey uh, independently without any assistance from staff. However, um, staff assistance was, was provided if the patient needed it. And in order pre to prevent any bias, uh, the research team, team, Steph and I, had no direct contact with the patient. And all responses were anonymous, like I said, and were not included in any patient health records with the hospital. So the outcomes of the patient image survey. The most commonly selected design elements and spaces were elements with characteristics of choice and control. Um, so the top five, the music panel, the controlled lights, the patient's room, the pool, and light dimmers. The staff survey, uh, the online survey was the Likert scale or self-reporting method. And it includes some ranking questions as well as open-ended, more uh, commentary sections. And there was one question essentially mimicking the patient image survey, asking staff to uh, rank images that they felt had a calming effect on the patients during their stay. And if you compared the top five features of the patient image survey with the top five features from the staff survey, you can see that there is a lot of overlap between the two. All right, the staff interview. Three themes were revealed uh, from the staff interview. Staff agreed that the unit's design features are of clinical utility. In other words, there are several reported positive impacts from the design features on the patient's self-coping and, and aid in their emotional regulation. The ability to adapt a patient's room 
to serve the patient's needs translated as well into a positive patient experience. So lighting, music, and the ability to have their parents uh, spend the night as well. And this was seen specifically on the ITC unit. And finally, the increase in physical activity, which was associated with a decrease in behavioral uh, issues. So staff relating the areas of muscle movement, especially the pool, uh, to a reduction of restraint and seclusion. And throughout the report, we did include some key quotes from, from the staff, as seen above, that reflect the staff findings uh, we just went over. And one specifically that stood out was a staff member reflecting on how one patient was really able to form um, their own coping mechanisms or their own bedtime routine through the space and the design features available through the unit. So prior to getting ready for bed, uh, this staff member was saying the patient really got into this routine of, you know, the hour before bed, going to the activity room and expending any excess energy, taking some quiet time um, in the quiet room by themselves, and then um, spending some time on their front porch mm -hmm. before going into their room and heading to bed. So patients are able to find, again, their, their self-coping mechanism or their routine through the spaces provided on the unit. So once again, just to bring it all home, the five key design strategies we just went over. And from the design strategies analyzed, we did realize that the one that stood out the most or was ranked the highest was areas of choice and control in non-threatening environments uh, for the patient. So through light, sound, and programmatic spaces. Right. Well, Sophie just shared a few of our early findings that we got from the staff surveys, interviews, and the, the image surveys as well. Um, in addition to that, we found a lot of really positive ratings from the staff on how they view the environment's influence on interaction with patients uh, for that. And uh, they, were, they were really starting to see this environment as now a tool that they could use in helping to achieve better outcomes uh, for with their patients. They also rated very highly the uh, impact of the environment on welcoming uh, and interacting with patients' families. We had heard from several during, uh, their, uh, during the interview process that the families would be very hesitant about uh, leaving their child. Of course, it's a very uh, you know, emotional thing, but uh, that they've watched this transformation of the family's confidence really raised uh, as a result of having a tour of this uh, unit and seeing the staff interact uh, with their child, that it's really been a positive impact, and especially mm -hmm. with the, having the accommodations available in the family or the needs adaptable rooms. And then lastly, a very high positive rating for impact on patient behaviors and that they're able to develop uh, better coping skills that they can use in and out of that hospital to really help with their emotional regulation. I associate, Sophie had mentioned that choice and control are really just these uh, essential elements that we see important uh, to this environment. And the environments are also an opportunity to provide both stimulating and calm spaces for the patients that are involved, and we're seeing that as an important part of uh, supporting a care model. And you know, we didn't talk about it a whole lot in this uh, talk here, but safety was an absolute top priority throughout the entire unit, and that can't be you know, said enough, especially in our mental health units. But when you get safety right, these other spaces uh, have additional value, and uh, so we can spend more time focusing then on spaces uh, that help with uh, emotional regulation and expending large muscle movement and, and such. So uh, safety is definitely still a top priority, and that came through in a lot of our staff conversations as well. And so just to wrap up here, our last section, I wanted to quickly touch on the limitations. It absolutely was a small sample size. It was just looking at this one project, but that was very intentional because it was exploratory in nature, and we were just starting to ask that uh, the question of how much of the space can really matter. And then we also did not collect any pre occupancy data benchmarks for this particular project. Uh, but as we've been able to kind of replicate uh, the methodology in other projects, we've been um, able to do that. And of course, I would say this is my favorite side about doing research and practices. What does it mean for us right now? And fortunately, with this particular project, they had a phase two, that, that other level that they were doing. We were able to apply a feedback loop immediately into some of that project. But also because of the type of work that we do, we're involved in a, several mental health projects throughout the year and being able to work with our project teams and immediately offer that feedback and the findings from this into current and future mental health-based projects. 
And one of the more interesting things that uh, we've been able to see is the application is actually beyond a healthcare uh, environment. And we've been involved in several schools that have been designed specifically uh, as special needs schools for children with severe autism and emotional behavioral disorder and other uh, and developmental cognitive disorder. Mm -hmm. That a lot of that same, those same strategies are applied into those environments. And again, repeat, re we have repeated this methodology in one of those schools and starting to find that a lot of the same elements are the highest ranked features in those schools as well. So it's a really interesting comparison but, um, beyond just the healthcare world. And then, of course, that commitment to just growing this body of research. We feel like mental health is such an important part for uh, research to be a part of, and so we look forward to uh, continuing into that um, contribution there. So, And that is all we had. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Before we get to the Q&A session, I would like to make a couple of announcements. This event is brought to you by the Center for Health Design. Thanks again to the Herd Journal for providing free access to the articles we typically review, and special thanks to today's sponsor, Steelcase Health. Please be sure to join us on August 30th for the next Evidence-Based Design Journal Club featuring Darcy Copeland, Assistant Professor of Nursing and at the University of North Colorado, and Sam Burnett, Senior Designer slash Principal at Earl Swenson Associates, as they discuss their study, Effects of the Unit Design on Acute Care Nurses' Walking Distance, Is Energy Expenditure and Job Satisfaction, a Pre-Post Relocation Study. For those of you who are currently designing a behavioral health facility, join us in Arlington on September 26th for an interactive collaborative problem-solving workshop intended to enable design professionals to employ physical design strategies and methodologies that support improved care for behavioral health. Registered by August 31st and save. Q&A, and now it's time for the fun part <laughs> where you get to ask your questions of the author authors in this case. Please feel free to type in any questions you may have. We already have several uh, queued up uh, and we will try to answer them. Okay, the first one that I have, uh, not time for that yet. The first one that I think uh, makes sense to start with, uh, somebody was asking about um, who developed the survey, which I think you touched on briefly, but also, so, so clarifying the roles there, but also clarifying the roles of how involved were you or were you not in the actual physical design of the facility? Well, uh, to reiterate, so to answer the first question, uh, we, we compiled the patient image survey, so we you know, actually created it, but then it was administered by trained staff. So we had no direct involvement with the patient taking the image survey upon their discharge from the unit. Um, as for how involved were we in the actual design of the unit? Uh, not very involved. <laughs> well, uh, our firm was. Yes, uh, yes, our firm. But uh, Sophie, and Sophie and I came in as researchers, and so trying to uh, be a little bit more objective as well, and not being as closely tied mm -hmm. uh, to the actual design in itself for that. So mm -hmm. uh, for that, and then uh, just to make sure that the survey question was also answered for the staff survey. Uh, we constructed that survey from scratch with the help of our our client partners on this, mm -hmm. and so it was uh, reviewed um, by their staff uh, and department manager before it got sent out. Fantastic, thank you. What were the patient room sizes? Oh boy. Um, again, we weren't on the project. It was uh, there. I don't have that information on the top of my head. They were varying sizes because there were some that were semi-private and some that were private. It was a uh, mid-century uh, building uh, for that, and uh, they tried to maintain as much of the infrastructure as possible. So I apologize, I don't have that off the top of my head uh, for that. But I wouldn't say that they were um, abnormally small or large. Yeah. <laughs> or many of them had uh, uh, that patient bathrooms with mm -hmm. them as well. Oh, great. So that leads me to another question based on um, a journal club uh, presentation that we had two times ago, uh, which is that you know, there's a, a big tension in the mental health facility design literature between the safety of multiple bedrooms and the experience, the patient experience of single bedrooms and the amount of control that they can have over their environment and privacy and all of that. Uh, did in the qualitative data, did anything come up about how 
the staff were negotiating that tension and making sure that patients were in the right place for them? Yeah, I don't know that anything really specific came up. I know mental health is, is different than, say, a medical surgical mm -hmm. unit, and we do often find that the socialization factor in mental health is still very important uh, mm -hmm. for that in, in a child-adolescent setting uh, that could be a benefit. Uh, I think each patient is going to be a little bit different than that, and I don't mm -hmm. recall any really specific comments. Did you, Sophie? No, no specific comments on if those semi-rooms created any tension, but I think uh, it would be important to mention the one um, method that we wanted to include in the study that unfortunately was not able to come to fruition, and that was trying to map where areas of tension or restraint and seclusion would occur. So then we would have not only uh, key findings associated with areas that promote calm, but areas that you know, on the other side of uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, what areas maybe you know, weren't so great. So maybe if we had, um, maybe if we were able to uh, have that method, um, it would have that would have been able to uh, answer your question. And unfortunately, the reasons for not uh, having that method uh, come about it was, was it was just not widely adopted by the staff. We uh, we made a map of the unit and just asked them to, after any um, incident of restraint or seclusion, to just mark on the map where that happened so we could see if there's any relation to the space. Um, but it's, it's hard to um, incorporate something into your routine, and we understand that, especially after um, a, a stressful incident like a restraint and seclusion. So we think of that. Yep. Sure. Uh, I think it's fascinating that you, you tried that. I think that would have been great had it we worked tried. out. We tried. Yeah. I'd like to try it again. <laughs> That's a really brilliant idea. But yeah, as you say, it's yeah. it's hard to get that kind of, uh, that, that requires a lot of buy-in to get things added to the routine around stressful events. To so combine a couple of other questions, um, what was the age range for this unit? And did you find that different there were different space needs for younger patients versus the adolescents? Uh, the age range was uh, quite large. It went from the early school age to early adult. And that I recall conversations with the design team is that they wanted the unit to be appealing uh, for both uh, young children and for uh, the teenage years for that. And we didn't, uh, because we did track the surveys anonymously, we didn't track any of the demo patient demographic data in terms mm -hmm. of what they ranked. That would be fascinating uh, mm -hmm. to see that. I think as we are doing more of the research and actually doing more of immersive observations, as we've done with some of the school environments, we're able to uh, look at those demographic differences slightly differently. But that would be a great suggestion for a, a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another person asks, um, you say there aren't any pre-designed benchmarks, but couldn't you compare behavioral reports on data such as the use of restraints, length of stay, quiet room use, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I think uh, part of the uh, context of this was that they had already started with this new care model before they moved into this unit. And so they saw their largest drop in restraint and seclusions actually happen before they moved. And um, then they saw an additional drop once they did move here. But I think it was because of that early work that Karen and uh, Susan and the team had done before moving into this unit, which I think was great because there's a lot of change just that comes with moving into a new unit, but having a good care model in place before moving mm -hmm. for that. And I think, um, you know, it is, it is a metric that we do track uh, for that, but they also didn't have, like, a quiet room before. Uh, they really had a very mm -hmm. basic unit that did not have a lot of these kind of value-added spaces. And they knew that because it was a renovated unit, they they wanted to put their money into some of these spaces that were going to have the most value for the patients. And so, I mean, they absolutely could have just had more patient rooms, but instead they opted to have more of these other types of spaces that were really unique and um, part of the program from the very beginning. Cool. Ellen asks, what were the biggest surprises in the results? Uh, for me, the biggest surprise was uh, how much overlap that the, we saw between the patients and the staff in mm -hmm. selecting the elements. I think four out of the five, top five for each were the exact same. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, it said that we were kind of on to discovering something. And I think the other further surprise for me was in doing the same study in a special education school, I think at least three of the top five there were the exact same there. So it was all about this choice and control. Absolutely. And I think that is something we've really honed in on and been excited uh, to, 
to take in on more mm -hmm. projects for that. And other surprises are just the absolutely wonderful stories that we've heard from staff about their experiences and the transformations that they've seen in the patients. And that's the stuff that's really hard to put into a, a black and white paper. <laughs> and I, I mm -hmm. wish everybody could go through a process like this to really be impacted by all of those uh, the true stories and uh, how staff, uh, they have such pride in their job um, because of this environment that they now work in. And that that was really just great to hear, I think, from all levels of the staff. Absolutely. Are there any particular stories you'd like to share with us? Because I do think that's one of the limitations of a journal article. There's only so much you can get in there and fit in, squeeze into that narrow narrative. But I know you get some so much richer data out of one of these qualitative studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, there was, I can tell the one story about the uh, actual the connection uh, beyond the just this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we didn't, and unfortunately during this particular study, we didn't do as much of the observations as part of this research project, and that is something that I, I really love doing as part of research projects, but because of mm -hmm. patient privacy, weren't able to for this one. But uh, when we took the same methodology and going into the school setting, I actually uh, was able to see a student at, at the school that had this yellow blanket and that actually had the embroidered emblem from the, at the time it was Amplab's Children's Hospital, um, but, uh, and because they give them to all the students, so all around the unit we kept seeing these yellow blankets. And mm -hmm. at the school here I saw this yellow blanket and it was great to see that that there's a continuation of environments for a lot of the same populations that they're learning coping skills uh, when they've had to yeah. be in more of an inpatient setting, but now they can thrive in this educational setting and uh, take that beyond uh, for that. So it was kind of one setting or one story that just kind of hit home just as a continuation of the project. Mm -hmm. and, but actually on the unit, I think it was hearing more of the routines yeah, about absolutely. how they like love the bubble column. And sometimes you're like, wow, this is a bubble column that is mm -hmm. so impactful for them, but they just they absolutely find uh, peace with that and can be calm mm -hmm. within that. And I think uh, the stories for us was the uh, hearing the story of how uh, staff were saying that they were going through the intake process or an interview with a, a potential family, and they got to that point where it says, okay, time to go tour the unit, and they actually um, froze up because they just they didn't want to take that family onto that unit because it, they they didn't have any pride in it. It didn't show the care, the quality of care that they were actually providing. I mean, they have an amazing program uh, for that and. To hear them talk about now how they're so excited to take this family on a tour, and it really just, you, they say you can kind of watch that family just get the sense of confidence and to, to move forward uh, with this as a, a care for their child. Uh, that, that's pretty impactful and, yeah, difficult to put into a paper. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I have a question here that's probably out of your ballywick, as you weren't the designers, but it is... Um, Saying much of the design seems very similar to the inpatient tower, which was opened in 2011, designed by Soy and Cobus and HGA. Did that project form the basis of the design for this project? Uh, yes, uh, that that tower did open, and that was actually uh, some of the vacated uh, units uh, in this tower is where this mental health unit moved into, I believe. Uh, so they wanted to carry through on a lot of that branding that was done from the environmental uh, project that was done there. And so, yeah, many of the elements uh, were carried over throughout the building on multiple projects, not just that one project that you saw photos of today. Great. Um, uh, the question from uh, Holly Aiken, I think. Uh, sorry, my glasses are off. Why no graphic <laughs> motifs as we typically see in children's environments? Graphic motifs such as... Yeah. Uh, well, there was... There was uh, there was small, uh, I guess, well, nature-based images. It was used on signage. It was used at the nurse station's desk. I remember they went through, if I can recall conversations with the design team, they went through a lot of uh, discussion and analysis over some of those graphic elements because of also the sensitive population that the interpretation of, say, icons and various graphic elements could be taken in a very different way. Um, okay. So that, and... Uh, so I think they they wanted to not uh, be overwhelming in a lot of those graphic elements and within the unit, but it, anything that was in there was more nature based and recognizable mm -hmm. from both a small pop or younger population up through an early adult population. If I can recall that correctly, for the yeah, team. that does seem like a challenge. Teenagers don't like to be uh, exposed to things that imply they're too young, uh, right. and even yeah. in the middle there. Um, uh, 
since one of the project treatment goals was to help the patients learn coping mechanisms for motion control, had you considered administering the image survey to the patient at the onset of their visit and then after to see if they recognize common features differently or more quickly or even recognizing more common features? I think to, to do it at the beginning, it depends on how soon at the beginning, uh, because they might not, I mean, first day might not be enough. Uh, they might time. not be familiar with yeah. the spaces and confusion. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they all, uh, they, my recollection is they don't, uh, they don't, everybody doesn't spend the same amount of time on, on the unit. And so I think we'd have mm -hmm. to find what the right balance mm -hmm. would be. But absolutely, as a follow up, it would be great to see mm -hmm. if they've developed. Um, and a better understanding of their environmental uh, features as a tool. Yeah, so they could recognize, well, I, I do better or I become more calm and more mm -hmm. after I expend a lot of energy yeah. or mm -hmm. uh, after I'm very social, then I feel a lot more calm or if I need mm -hmm. more um, secluded and private spaces. I think mm -hmm. that would have been really interesting mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Another person asked, did any of the design features target specific disability issues, such as Asperger's syndrome, which is challenging for socialization, et cetera? Uh, yeah, the needs adaptable rooms and the intensive treatment center mm -hmm. uh, were more adaptable for uh, physical needs. Uh, but in terms of more of that socialization challenge, uh, there was a lot of opportunity to balance the uh, uh, being socialized or choosing uh, to have social environments, but also spaces where they feel like they can um, be self-reflective mm -hmm. within that. And there was, um, I think the biggest challenge was the sharing of the spaces between the units. They think they found that the sensory room was over on the intensive treatment unit, mm -hmm. but everybody loved to go to that room. And so they had actually crossed mm -hmm. between the two units. And so I, I think if you were to ask them again, they would have more than one sensory room is because that one is a, a great room for, uh, um, for, mm -hmm. for the patients to go to to do more reflection time. Same with the quiet room. Mm -hmm. And when they only have one of each of those, they have to share the spaces. Mm -hmm. That does sound like a challenge. We didn't see much furniture storage, but a lot of built cabinetry. Is this for safety reasons? Um, well, I did I did mention as a best practice mm -hmm. to just allow for the spaces to be clean, uncluttered, and less distracting. Um, but as far as a safety issue, mm -hmm. I suppose it would lend mm -hmm. itself to that as well. Uh, if, if the question was more about the patient room, uh, there was, what you didn't see on the other side of the, the bed, is that there's cubby storage for personal mm -hmm. belongings that's open, uh, so there's no drawer safe storage. Uh, and but there was um, yeah very little in terms of like per personal based storage inside the rooms but there was there was a desk and mm -hmm. uh, stool and the bench that they could um, put some belongings on but then they did have a cubby area where they could do some personalization and mm -hmm. uh, other things like that but otherwise the rooms were mostly built in it was a, a pretty small floor plan because it was a renovated unit so we mm -hmm. didn't want to take up additional floor space with a lot of furniture. Mm -hmm. um, another person asked. Did you have a research basis for basis for how the curved walls could reduce agitation, or is that just sort of more a, a design intention? I think it was it was probably both. <laughs> there uh, again, <laughs> I can't really speak for the design team uh, for that, right. but we do know through uh, we've done several postdocs at other types of mental health uh, facilities and finding that uh, kind of reducing a lot of the harsh corners or areas where you know you can retreat into, but the the softness that is very intentional about a curved wall uh, is um, a positive thing. Uh, the in addition, it was kind of that color forms and materials mm -hmm. that were implemented as part of the project for that. It's, um, it reminded me of hobbit holes, which seems like a very positive thing to me. Um, uh, another person asked, could you please discuss the duration of the project and the cost? Sure. Um, Oh, of the research project or of the oh yeah good question. Project? I don't, we don't well that's a great that question I don't actually know I assumed it was the research project okay let's do it for the okay, research project well the data collection itself was a little under six months mm -hmm. and then analysis of that data um, was an additional three to four months mm -hmm. but then the entire publication process was a lot longer uh, than <laughs> both of us combined so. <laughs> I would say in total at least a year, year and a half mm -hmm. for when all is said and done. So from data collection to publication. Okay. Uh, was there a traditional? Of the, 
I have no idea. So the cost of um, we oh, right. um, we just we did it all internally. Mm -hmm. It was just our time that mm -hmm. was uh, put forth for the effort. So mm -hmm. we're just gonna <laughs> take that on, and so it was no additional. Mm -hmm. There was no grants involved in doing the project. Okay. Was there a traditional mental health seclusion room of the sort that's generally included on a, an adult mental health unit? And if not, how is this type of restraint managed in practice on these units? I believe there was. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm trying to think. Yep, I, there, yep was, there was. It was one. included yep. in the patient image survey. Uh, oh, it was yeah. not highly ranked. <laughs> 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 One would imagine not. Um, uh, how did staff feel about the open nurse station? This is always a big back and forth in the literature. Uh, were there any issues with safety? Uh, and another person was asking, were there any uh, issues with the open nursing station and um, oral privacy, people being able to hear each other, that sort of thing? Sure. Uh, you know, we didn't... There wasn't a ton of conversation about that during the, the interviews, but and we didn't do the observations. That we had a few conversations around it. I think they said that there's a little one of those wall cubby benches right on the other side of the nurse station, and that they said was busy all the time. Like children ran to spend time there to be there because they loved being by the staff. And so I think that that feeling of accessibility of the staff and building that sense of trust was really important uh, for them. Uh, yes, staff said that at times they wish they would have had more privacy. There was a workroom right behind it that did offer full privacy that was behind uh, a wall and doors so they could have more private conversations back there. But I think in building that sense of trust with the patients was also really important and so breaking down those barriers, not being behind a glass wall uh, for that. So it's all about the balance. You know, I still can't find that perfect answer for and every care model is different, every organization is different, uh, but I think it's it would be interesting to do another study on that, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, this is a, a, a an importantly different patient population than a lot of the literature, which is on the adult mental health units. Um, so um, another person asked, what value-added spaces were included in the program beyond the Joint Commission FGI guidelines requirements? Value-added spaces? Uh, I think a lot of them were like the quiet room, the sensory room, mm -hmm. um, even getting the additional um, uh, space to do the playground and the recommissioned therapy pool. I mean, those are right. really just highly valued spaces that you wouldn't find in just a, a typical based program that needed, you know, the patient rooms and the, the nurse station. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, it had on-unit dining. It had a lot of uh, very unique spaces in such a small space. It was a, I thought it was really impressive what they could combine in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and were there, because all those extra spaces that you don't normally see, um, and my experience with a lot of the people who uh, administer healthcare organizations is that when they think of high-risk pa patient population and spaces like these, their knee-jerk reaction is going to be, ah, safety, safety, safety. So were there any um, safety issues that came up in your discussions with the staff, or were there any... Um, sort of best practices that they discussed for how they maintain safety in these somewhat less controlled environments? Interesting. I mean, they reiterated that with the new unit, they felt safer uh, in a lot of their spaces. I think there was also the change management component. Mm -hmm. I think Karen mm -hmm. had to do quite a bit of training with staff and if there was an incident early, like it was trying to get on and understand why things happened. Uh, for that, but overall, it was a much safer environment. Before, there was a lot of unsafe areas, especially for the patients, and so they felt like this was an, a huge improvement, not only to keep staff safe, but the patients safe from themselves and from other patients. So, mm -hmm. it's uh, safety did come up quite a bit. I'm having troubles recalling the exact kind of mm -hmm. conversations around them, but it's uh, yeah, important. It was very important. <laughs> <laughs> a follow-up to the question about the uh, time and cost involved is, was your time absorbed in the project budget or did the client pay or help pay for the research? Or is research considered as a separate budget within your firm that is investing in the future? 
the last option. <laughs> so uh, we did this separate from the entire project. This was after occupancy, mm -hmm. and we had approached the client to say, hey, we're very interested in wanting to examine this project in closer detail and working, and th they were very excited to engage with that, and that's always a huge benefit to us to say, hey, we're interested as well. And they wanted to tell the stories and the, share in the successes that they were having with this unit. Uh, so we we gave the time, and they gave the time, and uh, together we're sharing in those results. Great. Um, is it your expectation that the calming features highlighted by your study are universal, or are they influenced by culture? I think the... I, I wouldn't call them generalizable yet uh, for that. I think we're starting to see that there's some commonalities between a unique pop population, a subpopulation within the mental health area, seen both now in healthcare and in a special education environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think each organization has to look at them in more detail to see what's appropriate that supports their care model. And, and then we need to do more studies around them to find out what is truly impacting it and start to really partner with some outcomes mm -hmm. uh, that we would be able to track, whether it's reduced length of stay, uh, you know, reduce, uh, complete reduced restraint and seclusion. Uh, there, there are some other metrics that we could bring into this to really start to understand it in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Great. Was there any pushback about safety for any of the design decisions? Uh, again, the open nurse stations are sometimes controversial because of staff feeling vulnerable. Um, you've got the, uh, the nice zip line up there, which uh, immediately I thought, ligature, um, those sorts of things uh, from the staff. Uh I don't, I don't know the conversations that had uh, occurred during design, and I apologize for that. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone on that question. Uh, for example, on the zipline note, they are supervised in that room at all times uh, for that, and they cannot go in there on their own. They need to be supervised. I think that was the case with that room. Cool. Um, another question is, could you please explain about the Sentinel event reduction bathroom doors? What is this? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, because there are uh, bathrooms in in the patient rooms, the doors, uh, we didn't include a picture of it, but the doors are actually slanted, uh, so to reduce that, uh, to be anti-ligature uh, for that. And that is an important part of mental health design uh, to go into that. So, uh, and the staff did allude to that during the interview, so it's been a big help in terms of the safety uh, within the patient rooms themselves. So both from the standpoint of the, the new care model that they have and from evidence that we got from our last journal club where we talked about the importance of lighting options that can be controlled by patients and staff. Uh, we're, we're getting more into this important, that controllability uh, that people have over their own environment. Could you talk a little bit more about exactly why that's important for this patient population and um, how people used that control? Well, I think it's important to uh, maintain some sense of uh, control or independence when you're uh, admitted to a unit like this, especially to reduce the stigma that's associated with mental health. I think that's a key um, key driver for maintaining that design strategy, I, I would say, first off, um, allowing, uh, allowing them some some semblance of, yeah. of independence is important. Mm -hmm. And if we can help in keeping them, if they can help themselves re mm -hmm. maintain a calm or to calm after an escalation through uh, being able to, even these small choice of control of the environment, mm -hmm. along with maybe some other activities that they have an, an option for uh, versus an option of putting them in a seclusion room. I mean, it's going to be healthier and help yeah. them focus on their behavioral and health goals uh, rather than on a focus of um, restraint for right. that. Right. Absolutely. Uh, another person asks, are there issues with privacy with the SER bathroom doors? Uh, not that I'm aware of uh, with that. I mean, we didn't ask those specific questions as part of this study uh, for that. And they, they do provide, um, I mean, they're, they're cut off on the bottom and on the top yeah. uh, of the door. So I suppose there could be some privacy issues with people in, in the bottom and the top, but... Uh, not aware of I've, <laughs> I've never known any major change to come without some pain, uh, even when it's mostly for the better. So did you get any feedback from the staff about the challenges 
with the new facility? I know you did mention that having the sensory, only the one sensory room and that on the secure area. Were there any other issues that people might want to look out for when they're trying something like this again? Um, I don't know if it was a, a challenge day one, but over time I know they had some issues with um, they wanted their their rooms, their social socialization rooms to be very open and welcoming to any patient. Oh. But over time, um, I think that maybe was uh, mm -hmm. abused a little bit, and patients were running into the group room, for example, during um, during group activities and kind of disrupting it. So I know that they had to uh, eventually put a door onto that room. And, um, I think that's one that's one thing that I can think of. Great. Um, it does seem to me that a lot of the things that, apart from the the individual control within the room of the music and the lighting, a lot of this seems to come down to physical activity. And in our our session before last, that was one of their major safety issues in the hallways. Was just. And this was with adults, if I remember correctly. They're just so little physical activity that they ended up running around in the hallways and bumping into each other and, and causing problems that way. Uh, and this facility, you've really done so much with the, the pool, the playground, the, the um, activity room. Uh, could you talk a little bit more as we wrap this up about the impact of that physical activity for the patients and for the staff and how perhaps that supports their care model? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I mean, it's a big part of their, their care model, and uh, but they do use the, the corridors. I remember walking around and seeing the scooters come zooming through. Uh, <laughs> that was neat. That's not something you see on a med surge unit at all. And so it's, mm -hmm. but what's interesting about using that corridor almost as space, Mm -hmm. And uh, because, especially here in Minnesota with our long winters, when you can't get out to that playground and move around, how else can you uh, get some of that movement to start happening? And also sharing in the spaces. And we can't put all of the patients in one the activity room at the same time. So having right. different options throughout is really important as they're balancing their different therapy sessions and um, socialization versus private time and, and things like that. So I think it's so well supported part of the care model. I so said they, they couldn't talk highly enough about the pool. And I think it was always like, is this pool thing re really going to work? And we have to transport them off the unit. Is that safe? And what are the concerns there? But they said that they've had very few problems in doing that because uh, the patients react to it so positively that they, they love going to that pool or they love going to the playground mm -hmm. as part of that. So I think it's been uh, just a huge success uh, for them to have. That's wonderful. Well, thank you both so much, Stephanie and Sophia, for this interesting and thoughtful look into how design elements and spaces influence behavior and well-being for patients, staff, and families in child-adolescent mental health units. This concludes our event. We will leave the webinar open for another 30 minutes so that you can download the EDAC and AIA CEU forms. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.